Hello folks, my name is Drew Leonard. Uh, hopefully you've been continuing our study with uh, the book of Isaiah and we're still talking about the authorship of it. The whole course is around the authorship of Isaiah and we're coming to the close of a very lengthy section in this unit uh, which is basically just an assessment of the context of Isaiah and we've been making quite a few suggestions as to how we should approach uh, the book uh, in Isaiah's context. So we're in lesson, uh, I guess this is lecture five, video five, but if you're following along, if you've got the workbook, we're on 3C. If you're reading from the book that's been written on the subject, uh, this would be chapter three, and it would be later in the chapter, chapter three. Uh, so anyway, we're continuing our discussion about Isaiah's context, and we're continuing a discussion about the authorship of Isaiah. Uh, question number one says, while the critical scholars argue that the presence of Babylon in Isaiah 40 through 66 is overwhelming and thus supportive of the notion that the exile is already underway in actuality at the time of the writing, what are some of the peculiarities that typically go unnoticed by these scholars? So I'm going to show you uh, a drawing as to how the authorship is typically understood by the critical scholars. If you take a look at our drawing program here, uh, Isaiah 1 through 39, as we've talked at some length, is treated as though this could be written by Isaiah, the 8th century prophet of Jerusalem. But then, because of various reasons, 40 through 66, that whole block of text is usually treated as late. And we understand why that is in the critical view of things. And so this unit, so we're told, revolves around a much later history than 8th century. In fact, we're told that it really revolves around 6th century and even forward beyond that. So, if somebody's writing here in this late period, as opposed to the early period, 1 through 39 and 40 through 66, we're told that the historical uh, content, we're told that the style, the language, the vocabulary, all of that in this later section poses as though it's written by Isaiah back here in the early period, but we know in actuality it's actually late, maybe even 6th century or beyond, and it's written in retrospect. We talked about ex eventu prophecy, which is the Latin for after the fact, after the event. This is what's being told about the unit of Isaiah 40 through 66. Oh, it's actually written later. Now this is very interesting because the question is asking, the critical scholars are supposing that Babylon is just all over this port, this part of the text, over this portion of the text. But it is very interesting, the first observation is that Babylon, Babylon which you would expect to be mentioned here and not so much here, Babylon actually appears nine times in the early part of the book and it only appears four times in the later part of the book. That is very interesting because we're told that Babylon is all over that later section. We're told that we should expect Babylon as the later portion because that's when that text was written. But it only the word Babylon, the people of Babylon, only appear four times in that later section, whereas it appears nine times in the earlier. That is very interesting. Another thing that's very interesting is that in the later part of the book, in 40 through 66, which we're told is constantly late, we're told that everything in 40 through 66 is written after Isaiah's day, by nearly 150 years. We are told that that is consistently late, but the sins that are discussed in that block, in that unit, some of the sins that are mentioned are actually sins from 8th century Isaiah, meaning that the sins that are being talked about in the later part, the part that the scholars are telling us is consistently late, the sins that are talked about are sins that happened before the exile. So for instance, I'm going to put this up on the screen for you. In uh, Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter, uh, let's see here, in Isaiah chapter 57, in Isaiah 57, we have a text that is given to us about the sins in which they were getting involved. Isaiah chapter 57, and let's begin in verse 5. Isaiah, or whoever the author is, if we're just giving the a liberal critical view any kind of credence, uh, 
This author in Isaiah 57 rebukes the people, and he's coming out of 56 where he's kind of doing this as well. But in 57 and verse 5, he says that these people of Judea were inflaming themselves with idols under every green tree. That is a sin that is explicitly related to Canaanite Baalism, and that is never practiced by the people of Judah or Israel after or even in the exile. Once they're in Babylon, they never practice this kind of sin again. Here's another one. Slaying the children in the valleys under the cliffs of the rocks. Sound familiar to anything else in your Old Testament? Sounds a lot like Manasseh's day, right? Sounds a lot like a day, Manasseh's day, very close there to Isaiah's day, just after Isaiah's day. Sounds to me like maybe Isaiah is rebuking and critiquing those sins of 8th century Judah and Israel. And then as we drop down a little bit further, here's verse 7. Upon a lofty and high mountain hast thou set thy bed, even thither wentest thou up to offer sacrifice. He's talking about Canaanite Baalism again. So it's very interesting, as though we're listening to the critical scholars tell us, well, the situation, the historical situation, is consistently late. It's consistently in the exile. It is very interesting that some of these observations we're making actually reflect an earlier date. What's the possibility? The possibility is maybe Isaiah wrote 40 through 66. But then this raises a very interesting and very complex question. If Isaiah is writing these things, uh, how should we explain 40 through 66? And how should we explain how it does appear to be situated in a lot of ways within the Babylonian exile? We'll talk about that here in a minute. So two interesting observations we can raise. Number one, Babylon is mentioned nine times in the earlier part of the book and only four times in the part that we're told is late. Maybe, maybe Babylon could somehow be a a thought in Isaiah's own day, even in the 8th century, and maybe he can project himself in some kind of way, in some kind of hypothetical vision, or even a vision received by God. Somehow he could possibly do that, uh, even in 40 through 66. We'll talk about that here in a moment. The second observation that's very interesting is some of these sins are pre-exilic sins and it reflects an 8th century authorship and not a later exilic or even post-exilic writing. Very interesting stuff. Okay, number two. What are some of the major points that McGuigan suggests in relation to Isaiah's predictive abilities and his mentions of Babylon? How is it important to recognize the creativity and imagination of the prophets here. Okay, this is very interesting. Jim McGuigan, who is a a master Bible scholar in my opinion, uh, has written a book on Isaiah. And earlier in a different installment, I told you where you could get this book and how I think it's very helpful. I think it is probably the best book on Isaiah out there at the moment. Uh, I have found it extremely helpful. He makes some suggestions in his commentary that really force us to think about how it is that the prophets speak. Generally, and this is why we talked about this in lessons three and somewhat in four, generally we understand the prophets to predict. When the prophets say uh, a child shall be born, we understand that to be a literal child. When the prophets say the wolf shall lie down with the lamb, whether we like it or not, there are some among us who understand that rather literally. Instead of going back to Eden and seeing that he's grabbing at a picture, he's painting a picture, in figurative speech, he's actually just painting the idea of peace. We typically try to understand the prophets in a very predictive way. And what I mean by that also is if we do understand it figuratively, we understand the prophets to speak allegorically, where these little things that are prophesied stand as spiritual items that just pervaded the prophets of their day. So here's what I mean. Um, Maybe in Ezekiel's text, Ezekiel 40 through 48, Ezekiel speaks of a new temple that is coming. And what we basically do is we say, "Ah, I know Ezekiel said temple, he means church. Ezekiel in Ezekiel 34 and Ezekiel 37 speaks of this coming shepherd and king, the Messiah. We cross that out and we say, I know he says David, Ezekiel 37, Ezekiel 34, But he means Christ, Jesus the Christ. That's an allegorical interpretation. What if Ezekiel and Isaiah, since that's who we're really speaking about, they're not so interested in making all these little predictive allegorical snippets, but what if it's the case that they're painting this broad scene? How would you speak to a Jew in the 8th century, 6th century, either century, that 
that is looking for hope or deliverance? How would you speak to that individual? Mm. You might say something about David as king. You might say something about a new temple. You might say something about a united empire. All of these kinds of things speak of the ideal time, an ideal time to the Jew. They're not predicting. They're not making an allegorical prediction. They're just painting a broad picture. And I like what McGuigan says in one of his books. He says, sometimes we see brush strokes where we ought to see entire portraits. The portrait that's being painted is one of hope and deliverance and peace. They're not painting all these little predictive allegorical snippets along the way. That's not what the prophets are doing. So how does this help us then with Isaiah's text? And how does it help us understand how he is, quote unquote, predicting? It is important to realize that Isaiah is describing and he is not predicting in the typical fashion. If Isaiah were making a typical prediction to a typical group of people, he would speak to that group and speak to them about a time after their day to come 200 years into the future. And he would speak to that present group that's listening in the 8th century about things that would come upon their long-lost descendants. But instead, Isaiah doesn't do that. He speaks to the people in the 8th century as if they and himself have been projected into the 6th century. So he actually places himself and his contemporary people, the nation, as if they're already into the exile. So he is describing, rather than just making a rigid prediction about events 200 years into the future. He's taking himself and the people and placing them into the future hypothetically in the vision, in the prophecy. And so he's being very creative about that. He speaks to the 8th century people as if they themselves will be the ones in the Babylonian exile. So that's what he's doing. I know this is very lofty. The next thing that's very interesting is maybe Isaiah thinks of Assyria. Now look at this. Look, let me pull up this uh, drawing pad and I want to show you what's happening. In, in Isaiah's day, who was the major threat? Who was the major threat? Well, it was Assyria. If we're talking about the 8th century, while Isaiah is actually prophesying, he's actually doing his work, his ministry here, who is the major threat? Of course, it is Assyria. If you're well acquainted with your Old Testament history, you know that Assyria, Sennacherib, some of these guys, tiglath pileser would be the ones to come in and invade northern Israel and even then head south towards Judea, specifically the city of Jerusalem. You know that story in 2 Kings 18 and 19 with Hezekiah and the death angel. So all of that's happening in the 8th century. Now, of course, then the Babylonian exile in actual human history lies off to the distance. It is 6th century when this takes place. The Babylonian exile takes place in the 6th century. What if, what if Isaiah, who does not ever live in actuality there, what if he has been informed in a predictive way, in a revelatory way, by God that Assyria, who is the oppressor then in his own day, will actually be replaced by this other enemy, Babylon? What if God has informed Isaiah of that? Or what if Isaiah somehow has some kind of intuition given to him by God about that? Here's the thing. Maybe Isaiah then starts to describe this in his hypothetical scenario, which is going to come 200 years later approximately. What if he describes Babylon in Assyrian characterizations or attributes or terms? So, yes, Isaiah sees Assyria as this enemy of the people of God. He sees Assyria, so says Isaiah 10, 5 through 15, as the axe in the hand of God, as the tool of God, fit for destruction. But what if Isaiah, who doesn't see Babylon filling that role of the oppressor or villain at his very moment, takes the characterizations of Assyria and paints Babylon in this projected vision in Assyrian terms and language? Perhaps that's exactly what he's doing. Now that, el that element is very creative, but it seems to me highly probable that th that is exactly what Isaiah is doing. God fills him in that Babylon will come in the future and destroy the people of God, take them off into exile. But because it's not happened in actuality and Isaiah isn't seeing all of this happen, 
150 years approximately, 200 years, I said 200 years, about 150 years in actuality. What if he describes Babylon in terms of the villain or the oppressor that is presently before him? Assyria. It seems to me that is highly probable. And so these are some things, these are some suggestions that McGuigan raises that we ought to at least consider about how Isaiah is predictively prophesying the coming of Babylon. Now this is very interesting. Number three, if you've got your worksheet, question number three says this. While child's approach is ultimately misguided, don't have time to talk about what his whole approach is, it's called canonical criticism, and that's a term he would have even despised himself. But do sometime, do a Google search and look up child, see what canonical criticism is, maybe YouTube it, there are a couple of videos on YouTube that speak of canonical criticism. And you might give those videos a watch just to figure out what it is that's being talked about. Child's view, ultimately, we need to reject it. Nonetheless, the individual was a very brilliant mind. Brevard Childs was a very brilliant mind. And here's the thing. What word does he use to see a connection between the two parts of Isaiah's text? How does an imaginative or creative reading of Isaiah fit with this? And how does prediction receive impact from these suggestions? So basically what I'm going to say is the same kind of thing I just explained, it's just in a little bit of a different slant. So here is Brevard Child's book on Isaiah. It is a different kind of commentary. It is a wonderful commentary in a lot of respects. It is a poor commentary in a few respects. You would have to ask me exactly what I mean by all of that. Nonetheless, very intriguing, very fun to read in my opinion. Now, Brevard Child sets forth this kind of lofty theological approach to the book of Isaiah. It's called canonical criticism. And what he sees, while I agree with this, I disregard his ultimate view. What I agree with is his way of categorizing the book of Isaiah in its approach to the oppressor or the villain. Let me draw out for you exactly what I mean. He uses the word on the question then on number three. What is the word that he uses? He uses the word ontological a word that specifically means the nature of being. The nature of a thing or the nature of its being. So what he's saying is that in the first block of Isaiah, the oppressor or the villain is Assyria. But the text bridges itself, specifically in chapters 36 through 39, as Assyria starts to fade out and in its place, in Assyria's place, comes Babylon. Do we see any connection between Assyria and Babylon? It's at this point that we need to have a creative approach and realize that maybe Isaiah at this point in the text is not so concerned with the specific name Assyria or the specific name Babylon, but that there is an ontological, a natural connection between the two and that Assyria and Babylon share the connection in that they are both the enemy or the oppressor or the villain that would ultimately destroy or capture the people of God. I think that is an excellent way of looking at Isaiah's text. Now, I would still argue that Isaiah is writing that later part of the text. Childs is going to reject that and say it's written by a school of authors or another Isaiah, Deutero-Isaiah, Trito-Isaiah. You know how that approach is. You've watched enough now. Childs still takes on the critical approach. It still holds that view. I would still reject that view, and what I'm going to argue is that Isaiah himself through means of predictive prophecy and through means of revelation from God, he sees an ontological connection between Assyria and Babylon. To take this a step further, and Childs would agree with what I'm about to say, he might word it a different way, but there's an also an ontological connection if we were to extend Isaiah's text even into the New Testament, and we see this in Rome. There's a reason that John looks back into Isaiah's text or Zechariah's text or Daniel's text and he sees that those oppressors back there prefigure or model or foreshadow or stand as prototypes for another coming oppressor. Rome is a coming oppressor, incidentally called Babylon in the book of Revelation. Now, why is this drawn out? Why is there this allusion back to the Old Testament by John, the writer of the book of Revelation? He sees an ontological, natural connection. So as you look at number three again, on your, on, uh, in the workbook, and the question then asks, what word does he use to see a connection? The word we're looking for is an ontological connection. 
The next question on number three is, how does an imaginative or creative reading of Isaiah fit with this? How does this fit? Well, what we mean by that is Isaiah could see his contemporary events transpiring right before his eyes. If Isaiah were to look outside of his house and you asked him, Isaiah, who is the enemy? He's probably going to tell you Assyria. Assyria is the enemy. But if we allow him to speak beyond, even if it's an imaginative or an ideal or an ontological kind of prediction, kind of prophecy, he might speak to us about Babylon. He might go further. The text doesn't do this explicitly, but I would, I would venture to say that if Isaiah were with, here, were with us here today, he would even say that his text speaks about Rome, not in an original context kind of way. He doesn't speak about Rome explicitly. Even, even implicitly would not capture what we're trying to say here. Isaiah's text has an original meaning about the historical context it's situated in. Assyria, that's what he's dealing with. But his text on another level, in light of the entire biblical canon, speaks to us beyond, and he even speaks about those enemies that would oppress the people of God in the New Testament, whether it be the city of Jerusalem, whether it be Rome. And I believe that if we allow Isaiah's text to continue to speak in the way that it speaks, ontologically that is, I believe Isaiah would even speak to us about our own villains and our own oppressors today. Now you and I both know then that Isaiah's original context has nothing to do with Rome, with enemies or villains that we face in our own lives, but that is the kind of connection and that is the kind of rich theological element that is embedded within the text, not just of Isaiah, but of the entire body of Scripture, the entire canon. And I believe we ought to also take what is considered a fundamentalist view to those things. So I believe also in the authorship of Isaiah, the 8th century prophet writing verse, uh, chapters 40 through 66 of his book. But nonetheless, we see this kind of thing duplicating itself. We see Isaiah seeing Assyria, but he also sees it duplicated in the, uh, the Babylonian enemy, the Roman enemy, enemies we face today and even beyond our day. Isaiah's text still speaks. And then the third question, how does prediction receive impact from these suggestions? Well, we're not looking then for a flat, clinical, sterile, wooden, historical rendering of predictive prophecy. Now, sometimes that may be the case, but in Isaiah's text here, what we're giving, at least as a suggestion, is that maybe Isaiah has a little bit more imagination, creativity, idealistic view of things. Maybe he's not so wooden and flat and sterile. But maybe he's thinking and seeing in an ontological way, and he's not predicting allegorically. He's painting a bigger picture for us. And so he sees Babylon that's been revealed by God, predictively. He sees Babylon, but he sees Babylon functioning in place of Assyria, which would explain why, in a lot of respects, Babylon is described in 8th century terms in the later part of Isaiah a point that the critical scholars do not want to face. There are 8th century descriptions and characterizations in Isaiah 40 through 66. If you're a critical scholar, that should not be taking place. Why is it? Maybe it's the case that Isaiah is writing about Babylon as though he sees Assyria and he sees that ontological connection and he's painting Babylon in Assyrian terms. Seems to me that's highly a possibility. Number four. The critical scholars usually appeal to the status of the temple to suggest three distinct divisions of Isaiah's text. Let me remind you for just a moment what that means. The critical scholars want to insist that 1 through 39 functions as pre-exilic. The critical scholars want to insist that 40 through 55 functions as in the exile. And they want to argue that 56 through 66 functions as post-exilic. Three divisions. So here the temple is standing before the exile. Here the temple is destroyed while in the exile. Here the temple is rebuilt after the exile. Okay, let's read the question again then. What are some of the problems with this nice and neat suggestion? If this were true... This would make for a really easy way of reading the book of, of Isaiah. The problem is, is it's just simply not true. In fact, there are some passages that really disrupt this way of thinking, and it makes the text not read so smoothly. 
So, for instance, in chapter 43, verses, uh, verse 28, 43, 28, let me jump over to our Bible program and I want to show you this. In Isaiah chapter 43, now remember, 43 falls within that passage, uh, that section that ought to be while the temple is destroyed. But in 43, 28, he says, Therefore I have profaned the princes of the sanctuary and have given Jacob to the curse and Israel to reproaches. This is the King James Version. You need to read some of those other versions, New American Standard perhaps, and look at how they translate the verbs here. It looks like in 4328, the temple is not so much as gone as much as it's yet to be destroyed. Well, the temple shouldn't be standing in Isaiah 40 through 55 as the critical scholars paint it, yet we see some uh, confusion on this point. Give 4328 a read in a couple of the other versions, and you might see that the critical scholars and uh, the text isn't so nice and neat as they would have us read it. Another one is 64. Remember, 64, Isaiah 64. Should the temple be standing or not in Isaiah 64, beginning in verse 10? Well, it should be. It should be standing. The temple should be standing because this is after the exile. This is written by a late, 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 late group of authors who are looking back even at Zerubbabel's day. Temple should be restanding. That's what the critical scholars often suggest. But look at 6410. Thy holy cities are, present tense, a wilderness. Zion is, present tense, a wilderness. Jerusalem is a desolation. Our holy and our beautiful house where our fathers praised thee. Look at this. Uh, and all our pleasant things are laid waste. Oh, and then they ask about the affliction that's very present in 64, 10, and 11, and 12. Why are they saying this thing? And why does this kind of text find its place in Isaiah 64, 10 through 12? This betrays what the critical scholars suggest as a nice, easy reading of the text in three distinct units. And then 63, 18 says the same kind of thing, that their house had been destroyed by fire. Why are they writing this kind of thing as though it's still the present condition of the temple? It's not at all fitting into the nice and neat suggestions of the critical scholars, is it? Temples shouldn't be uh, undergoing this sort of thing in these parts of the text. Yet that's exactly what Isaiah 63, 64 is reflecting. Interesting. What are our suggestions? Maybe it's the case. Here's what I think. Here's what I think. Let me open up our writing program, and I want to show you a possibility. Uh, I think that it's very possible that Isaiah is familiar with his 8th century situation. Here is Isaiah. And God is speaking to him of a time, a time that lies in his future. Now, Isaiah, in the entire book, not just 1 through 39, not just 40 through 66, in the entire book, he moves in and out of his own time frame, and he moves into this distant hypothetical of exile and then hope after the exile. So it wouldn't shock me if we read Isaiah at one point speak of things in his own day. Wouldn't shock me a bit if he spoke of Assyria in his own day as being the one to bring the exile. Wouldn't shock me a bit if at times he moves into the exile and recognizes by divine revelation that Babylon's going to take Assyria's place. Wouldn't shock me a bit if sometimes Isaiah assumes that this has already taken place, assumes, and in his hypothetical, he reaches far beyond that and even speaks of a distant hope that lies after the exile. I think Isaiah has that kind of possibility to imagine, or especially if God's revealing all this by divine revelation, I think Isaiah can paint this kind of scenario. What if I were to tell you that tomorrow I'm going to go to the store? But what if then I tell you in that hypothetical, I tell you, now when I get back from the store, is that kind of remark really to be treated? If I were to say, when I get back from the store tomorrow, do I really need to treat that as though I'm already in that scenario? Of course not. Of course not. We speak this way. We speak about hypotheticals. We speak with that kind of intuition about the upcoming future. Now, I'm not to say, I'm not saying by any means that that's what we ought to reduce Isaiah's prediction to as mere intuition. That's hardly what I'm arguing for. What I am saying is that there can be the case that Isaiah pushes himself into this hypothetical 
where they're coming out of the exile that he has assumed has already taken place in his rhetoric, in his speech, in his prophecy. So we don't need to reduce all of this to three distinct historical units and say that it's pre-exilic, exilic, and post-exilic. That, that does a major disservice to the creativity and the um, just, just the, the movement of the prophetic text. That's hardly what's going on, but that's what the critical scholars want to reduce it to. It's not nearly that wooden, clinical, or sterile. Isaiah is projecting himself and the people of the 8th century into a later situ situation or scenario. He is assuming in his proclamation that they're already in the exile, and sometimes he's going to speak to them about hope after it, even though it hasn't come about in actuality. That is how, in some cases, we ought to read the Old Testament prophets. So, what does McGuigan end up suggesting as a means of resolving the difficulty? We've talked, to the, talked about this at some length now. The prophets are creative. They have a level of intuition. They see the ontological connections. And sometimes they describe the, their situation as they have moved them into a distant, assumed situation or scenario. I know that's lofty. I know it's complex. I know it's tough to follow. But it seems to me that if we're to reject the critical view, this seems to me to be a very plausible explanation as to how the prophet is working. So, Isaiah, even in Isaiah 1 through 39, there are times in the entire work where he moves in and out of his own day to a future day of destruction and exile. He moves back to his own day. He then speaks beyond the exile and speaks of hope or re re um, redemption beyond that. He comes back to his own day. Isaiah is not restricting himself only to the imminent present. He is also speaking to us in hypothetical terms about a future desolation and even beyond that to a future hope of redemption beyond. Isaiah is assuming all of this and he's presenting it in that kind of way, it seems. Okay, number four. Briefly, this this um, course does not deal with a commentary on the book of Isaiah. So what I'm about to say, you're going to have to do your own research. I would highly recommend reading Jim McGuigan on this point. But what briefly, briefly, what can we give as an assessment of the servant of the Lord? There is a lot of disagreement about this, and I want to give you a couple of views, tell you how I think we ought to go with it, and we'll move on quickly. If you take a look at our drawing pro program uh, here, I've got it open. The servant of the Lord is discussed in four texts. The servant of the Lord is discussed in four major texts. This is a point that often goes unnoticed by those who just simply and casually want to say, oh, the servant of the Lord in Isaiah is Jesus. Well, that's hardly doing service to the Old Testament text. Just to say it's Jesus and just to move on. Even the New Testament is not so bland on the point. In Isaiah's text, there are four major sections that speak of the suffering servant. That is Isaiah 42, Isaiah 49, Isaiah 50, and then of course 52, 13 through 53, 12. So we'll just go ahead and put 53. Those four chapters are the chapters that are called the servant songs. They are four distinct units in the book of Isaiah. Now, often it goes explained, well, in all of these cases, the suffering servant is Jesus. I do not want to disagree with that. What I want to do is I want to expand upon that. To say that the suffering servant in these texts is Jesus, and just to leave it at that, no further explanation, I want to show you that this creates a real problem. It creates two major problems. Number one is the context. Look at this in Isaiah chapter 41. Uh, in Isaiah chapter 41, beginning in 8 and... 9, beginning in 8. Isaiah chapter 41, beginning in verse 8. This second unit, what's called by the critical scholars as Deutero-Isaiah, opens up in chapter 40, and it starts to speak about hope and comfort, all of this beyond the exile. Uh, but in Isaiah chapter 41, verse 8, in speaking in this unit, he says, but you... Israel are my servant. That's what the context says. And he says, Jacob, whom I have chosen. He says again the same kind of thing in 9. He says multiple times in Isaiah 40 through 55 that the servant is Israel. Does this disagree that Jesus is the servant? 
hardly. It doesn't disagree at all. But to say that it's only Jesus, first, the problem is it really harms the context. The second thing that's very interesting, and I know I'm assuming that you know all of the contexts here in order to make these points. I know I'm moving quickly. But in Isaiah chapter 49 and verse 4, Then I said, this is the suffering servant, I have labored in vain, I have spent my strength for naught and in vain, yet surely my judgment is with the Lord and my work with my, and the text says, God. Okay. In 49.4, I don't know if you're picking up on what the the servant is declaring, but the servant is saying, I have failed in my task. Well, what was the task? I'm not really interested at this point to say everything that was Israel's task, but the task that God gave to Israel, specifically in Isaiah 49 and 42, is, so he says in 49.5, to bring Jacob again to him, to restore or gather Israel again. The nation of Israel should be gathered again. And then in 49.6, look at the task that was given to Israel. It is a light thing that thou shouldest be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob. We just read that in 49.5 as well. And to restore the preserved of Israel. I will also give you for a light to the Gentiles. Okay. Two major problems then with just saying that the suffering servant is Jesus and just leaving it at that with no further emendation. Two major problems. The first one is it betrays the context. The context of Isaiah specifically. We must understand Isaiah in his original context first. And then, secondarily, we must understand Isaiah in the New Testament context. If we accept the Bible on its face value, and I do, Isaiah... And then the New Testament interpretation of Isaiah will in no means disagree or contradict. They will harmonize and they will perhaps even expand. So Isaiah is going to force us to read the New Testament in a new way and the New Testament is going to go back and force us to read Isaiah in a new way. And it's going to create this kind of creative loop where the two texts continually add to each other and force us to see more in the New Testament or more in the Old Testament than perhaps we realized upon a first surface glance. Okay, so let's go back to our drawing program, and I want to show you then uh, why we need to go beyond Jesus, why we need to move a little bit beyond Jesus. As we look at our drawing program here, and we pull our drawing back up, we cannot simply say that it is Jesus. So, here's what's happening. There's a second suggestion. Maybe it was the righteous remnant. In Isaiah chapter 41, we just read that Israel or Jacob, same thing, Israel or Jacob was given the task of taking salvation to the Gentiles. And in 49.4, the text says of Isaiah, the the, the nation as a whole failed. So, there's a suggestion, third, that maybe it's the entire nation. Well, the nation couldn't accomplish taking salvation to the Gentiles. They failed at the task, so says 49.4. So it looks to me like the task is then given to a better class. The, the promise, the task is still kept within Israel, but it's given to a more directed group in Israel, the righteous remnant. And then it's the righteous remnant that fails again. They can't do all of the things. What was one of the major things in Isaiah 50 and 53 that was required of the suffering servant? Vicarious suffering. Suffering for all the sins of the world. Now here's the thing. If I were to ask you, is the suffering servant exclusively, only, is the suffering servant only the nation? We've got to say no. Was the suffering servant only the remnant? No. Was the suffering servant in Isaiah only Jesus? No. Here is what Isaiah's text is presenting. If we can draw a figure, there is a... Triangle, I think, is a good way. This is what um, I believe it was Kyle and Daylich suggested. Gleason Archer kind of picks up on it. Jim McGuigan picks up on this same kind of uh, tri dimensional view. At the base, the task, all of the task that God had in store for humanity was given to the nation of Israel. Given to the nation of Israel. They failed. And so the promise was not removed from Israel, but redirected specifically to the remnant, the righteous, the faithful righteous group in Israel. And they couldn't accomplish the task either. And so they were discarded, not necessarily discarded, but they reached their pinnacle, they reached the apex, 
in a singular indivi individual in an individual and that is Jesus the Christ who is the nation of Israel in a body so it's you cannot separate Jesus from the remnant you cannot separate Jesus from the nation Jesus is the nation of Israel in a body and then what's even more interesting if we had room here we would expand as Isaiah's text does in four uh, in 54 in 56 also 54 verse 17 and 56 expands now after Jesus accomplishes the task there are more servants all of the righteous that are ever involved in human history they now find their fulfillment in this servant figure as well as they are called servants and Paul would even pick up on this in some cryptic New Testament texts the New Testament Christians or Israel they're Israel I am getting in into stuff we shouldn't be here the New Testament Christians they are the people of God they're embodied in the person of Jesus as well a lot of theological growth that's taking place in this concept I understand nonetheless here's the question on I on uh, number five what is a good explanation for the identity of the servant of the Lord in Isaiah 40 through 55 I think this is a good explanation that we have to view it from three different angles a national perspective a remnant perspective and ultimately an individualistic perspective in the Messiah figure Jesus the Christ who could accomplish salvation for the Gentiles and who could accomplish um, uh, vicarious suffering and is meeting the qualification of being an individual whichever individual whomever that Isaiah was thinking of in 53 Isaiah had some kind of inkling from God that there was going to come an individual who would do all of this and that's what he's painting it's a third it's a three-dimensional kind of thing we've got to view it from three ways and then what are some what might be a good figure I think the triangle is a pretty good way at illustrating that is there prediction in this we hinted at this in the last installment yes yes there is but if we were to ask Isaiah in his Old Testament historical setting who is the Messiah I don't think he would know he doesn't say Jesus he doesn't give us any of those specifics like that and if he does give us those specifics he doesn't know that he's doing it necessarily he doesn't name Jesus like he does Cyrus Isaiah 44 28 Isaiah 50 uh, 45 1 and so if we ask Isaiah are you predicting Jesus he might have very well said no and this is from a very limited humanistic understanding but if we were to ask God from an unlimited perspective and we said God if we said God was there any prediction in Isaiah 53 about Jesus maybe it's just the case that God knowing the end of a thing from the beginning would say yes is Isaiah 53 predictive prophecy to Isaiah I don't think he knows all those specifics give first Peter 1 10 through 12 a reading in your own time if it was so clear why didn't the Jews get it when Jesus showed up it wasn't so clear it was not so clear and Isaiah didn't understand it fully either he had a limited understanding and that understanding was true definite it was accurate but it was by no means the revealed mystery that the New Testament would bring forth if we asked God God did Isaiah 53 was there more in Isaiah's words was there more in those texts than even Isaiah realized I think God would say yes I think God would say yes that text was predictive number six the critical scholars usually charge that there are contradictions between the different sections of Isaiah for instance hope in Isaiah 1 through 39 rests in messianic figure whereas that figure seems absent from Isaiah 40 through 66 why are such suggestions problematic or lacking weight let me show you the argument if we pull up our drawing program once more here's what they're saying in 1 through 39 there is mention of Messiah do you ever see the Messiah mentioned in 40 through 66 they're going to say no they're going to say in 1 through 39 we see nothing about the servant of the Lord but in 40 through 66 we see a lot about the servant the suffering servant of the Lord and so they say that this is a contradiction 1 through 39 is obviously a different author than 40 through 66 40 through 66 speaks about the servant the former part does not the former part speaks of a Messiah figure uh, 40 through 66 does not simply put and also because we're running out of time this is not a contradiction these are contrary statements 
Just because 1 through 39 speaks of Messiah and this section does not, hardly says that this is a contradiction. Can I speak of a Messiah as somebody else could not? Absolutely. Uh, could I speak of a Messiah in one context or in another context I might not? Absolutely. Am I contradicting either myself or the other individual in either context? No, of course not. So it's not a contradiction as the scholars continually write about it. That's not a contradiction. They need to do a better definition. They need to give a better definition of what they mean by contradiction. And then maybe we can work out the issue. I don't know. I really think that we're going to be at odds on a lot of this. And then the second thing is, sometimes this section of Isaiah does write about a Messiah, but it does it by means of a different phenomenon. The word that we're looking for is intertextuality. Intertextuality. Sometimes this passage over here in Isaiah, the later part, 40 through 66, can speak of a Messiah, but it does it in a very subtle way, as takes place perhaps in Isaiah 65 or some of the others, where Isaiah 65, 25, 65, 25, goes back and grabs hold of Isaiah 11, 1 through 16. And while Isaiah 65, 25 says nothing about a Messiah, it's using the same kind of rhetoric that is used in Isaiah 11, 1 through 16. Maybe it's the case that Isaiah, the 8th century prophet, is speaking to us about a Messiah, though he doesn't use the explicit term. He's expecting us, it seems to me, he's expecting us to catch this former text and know what all's involved in it. Even though he doesn't say Messiah here, he's expecting us to know this context and put it into a messianic context. It's not a contradiction. And secondarily, maybe it's the case that Isaiah is expecting us to see those subtle echoes or allusions to his own texts. And maybe he's not just not contradicting. He's actually preaching about those things that the critical scholars aren't picking up on. Maybe that's the case. Number seven. While the critical scholars often raise an argument about different style and language, thus concluding that such reflects a multi-author view, what did Archer, Wilson, and then even T.K. Chain, a critical scholar who opposed a single author view, have to say about the argument? I want to read you a couple of quotes here. This is from the book. You can find this starting on page 98. If you take a look at page 98, let me start by telling you what uh, Gleason Archer, and of course I don't agree with everything he says, but he's got a good quote here, I think. What did Gleason Archer have to say about the critical view and the style and the language? Here's what he says. This type of evasion, appealing to language or style, appears to savor of circular reasoning. Second Isaiah must have been written by a different author from first Isaiah because of the stylistic differences. That's what we're told. But where the most striking stylistic similarities, not differences, similarities are pointed out, where the most striking stylistic similarities are pointed out, these, so we're told by the critical scholars, indicate only that the later author was a pupil or an imitator of the original author. And Archer appropriately states, thus the facts are made to conform to the theory rather than deriving the theory from the facts. Do you see the problem? When they see differences in style, they insist that demands different authorship. When they see similarities, instead of saying, well, it's actually similar in places as well, maybe that reflects same authorship. No, they say that actually reflects different authorship as well. It actually reflects somebody trying to mimic Isaiah. They're trying to have it both ways. Trying to have it both ways. Okay, what's R.D. Wilson? Robert Dick Wilson, who was a professor at Princeton uh, before the major split and then went on to be a professor at Westminster Theological. What did he have to say? Here it is. Is it likely that a forger of a document would, scores of times, use phrases that occurred seldom, if ever, in the document recognized as having been written by the author whose works he was imitating? Would not the perpetrator of a pseudepigraph, pseudepigraph uh, intended to be accredited as a genuine work of the author whose name was falsely attached to it have had the prudence or common sense to avoid as far as possible all indications of recognizable variations from the acknowledged originals of the man whose name he has attached? Do you catch what he's saying? If here's a false writing, wouldn't the, the false writer, wouldn't the, the fraudulent writer, if he's mimicking, he's trying to mimic the author whose name he's posing as, wouldn't he have had enough 
intuition or common sense to avoid any kind of indication of variation from the original. So it, it's betraying. You can't speak of both the similarities and the differences and then still say that both reflect different authorship. It's, it's circular reasoning at its finest. And then here's one that's very interesting. T.K. Chain, a professor well-versed in Hebrew syntax, well-versed in the languages, fully opposed a single author view, fully opposed attributing the entire text just to Isaiah, the 8th century prophet of Jerusalem, world-renowned critical scholar. Listen to what T.K. Chain had to say. This is one of their own, if we could use the rhetoric of Paul. One of the critical scholars' own said this, My own opinion is that the peculiar expressions of the latter prophecies, speaking of Isaiah, are, on the whole, not such as to necessitate a different linguistic stage from the historical Isaiah. And that, that conclusion, consequently, the decision of the critical question will mainly depend on other than purely linguistic considerations. Do you catch what Chain is saying? T.K. Chain is saying, um, the style, the language, the vocabulary doesn't do the trick. It doesn't fit the bill. You're going to have to look for other reasons as to why we favor the multi-author view. Even a world-renowned critical scholar who's well-versed in Hebrew syntax looks over the text and says, yes, it's not enough. The style, the language, the vocabulary, it's not enough for us to warrant the conclusion that there's a multi-author um, book penned by multiple Isaiahs. So, interestingly enough, even one of their own has recognized this is not doing it. This is not cutting the bill. And then number eight, why is it ironic that the critical scholars call attention to the lack of a superscription in Isaiah 40 through 66? Let me go ahead and answer that before I address the second part of the question. Read one of the books on Isaiah as one of the critical scholars bellyached about how Isaiah 40 through 66 doesn't have a superscription. It doesn't say that it was written by Isaiah. It doesn't claim authorship by Isaiah in any place in Isaiah 40 through 66. And they asked that basically we, it, we should expect that it would have a superscription. Here's my problem. If it had a superscription, the critical scholars still wouldn't accept it. They'd call it a light gloss. Isn't that what they did in Isaiah 1-1? Isn't that what they do in Isaiah 13-1 especially? Of course they do. So it simply will not do for us to look for a superscription in Isaiah 40 through 66 when they're already going to throw it out and call it a light gloss, even if there were one. Horrible argument. Then this, how is the lack of a superscription in the section, Isaiah 40 through 66, it doesn't ever say that it's written by Isaiah, how is that actually an argument in favor of an Isaiahic authorship? Here's the reason. It's already linked to the superscription of 1-1. Even the critical scholars admitted back in 1-1, well, yeah, that functions as a superscription for the whole book. Now, they treat it as a late gloss. Some other author, or maybe the other people just went ahead and attached 40 through 66 onto 1 through 39, and the heading was already there. I know they treat that as like it's not intended by Isaiah, the 8th century prophet, as functioning for 1 through 66. They're going to tell you that 40 through 66 wasn't even written yet. But here's the interesting thing. The fact that 40 through 66 finds itself attached to 1 through 39 and doesn't give us another superscription actually suggests that those oracles were recognized as written by Isaiah, the 8th century prophet. Maybe that's exactly what happened. And then number nine, why is it problematic that the identity of Deutero or Trito Isaiah remains elusive? Who was Deutero Isaiah? Every critical scholar says, we don't know. Who was Trito Isaiah? Every critical scholar, we don't know his identity. We don't have a name for the individual. Is that not odd? Is that not odd that all of the Jewish history, this great writer who writes about the suffering servant, some of the greatest prophecies in the entire biblical text, isn't it odd that we still don't know his name? There's no record of such a school of authors writing and amending Isaiah's original text. Isn't that a little bit odd, conspicuous to say the least? I think it's very odd, and I think the fact is this, there is simply no evidence, no real evidence for a second or third Isaiah or schools of Isaiah. If we start to examine the evidence, where is it for Deutero or Trito Isaiah? It seems to me we've already come up with this organic evolutionary theory 
along with the principles that have been taken and applied to our sciences, we're now applying to our literature. It seems very clear to me there is no evidence for a Deutero or Trito Isaiah, and we're simply coming up with a theory in order to harmonize with our naturalism. Friends, again, the problem is the debate between supernaturalism and naturalism. I'm going to go back to that argument again in the next couple of installments, but as we think about Christianity, there's a lot rooted here. It's not just about the authorship of Isaiah, which is maybe just a, it's an outgrowth of a deeper problem. The deeper problem is whether or not you and I believe in any kind of miracles ever happening in human history. And if they did not, we still have no redeemer for sin. We have no ethic. We have no morality that can be objectively judged. And those are arguments we'll make later on. In conclusion, we've talked about nine major questions, tough questions, complex questions. Very well could have been the hardest lecture uh, again, the last two have really been a bear, haven't they? Uh, but as we talk about Isaiah's authorship, we're coming to a close of our uh, series. And in the next, lecture number six, we're going to talk about the New Testament's testimony and how it bears extreme weight on the discussion. Up to this point, we have only talked about the context of Isaiah. We've offered what seemed to me to be a logical, rationalistic, suggestions as to how Isaiah could be the 8th century prophet and yet still write the entire text that bears his name. Do we believe in miraculous prediction? Yes. Do we believe that it's just a flat item for item allegorical prediction in every case? No. We've offered several suggestions as to how there could be an ontological connection, an intuitive connection. Isaiah can be describing rather than just making a rigid prediction 200 years into the future, we've come up with all these kinds of possibilities that would still honor the context of Isaiah and would not betray his original meaning. And then we can perhaps see how the New Testament is going to come in and realize some of these things and even make their own claims on the authorship of the book of Isaiah. Hopefully you accept a supernaturalistic Christianity. Without one, there is no hope. Paul's argument, 1 Corinthians 15, 12 through 20. Until next time, May God richly bless you always to his glory.